Corey Stanford. Very good. Good Thank job. you, Christian. So as he said, uh, you know, my, my job at Corelight is really to work on you know, rapid prototyping, just what is innovative ideas, and you, which basically means I just fail a lot. That's basically what that means. And so that's just kind of part of prototyping. And so this talk kind of focuses on one of those prototypes um, that we've been working on um, inside of Corelight and, and you know, heavily relying on Zeek, right? And, and, and really you're talking about the, you know, the, the structure of this is really around cloud, right? And working inside of cloud environments and the challenges that those cloud environments are going to bring as you know, you know, service loads or compute moves from the on-prem world into the cloud, right? It's kind of inevitable that not all things will, but a lot of things will move there. And as we do, how do we ensure that the data and the network analysis that we've been able to do on-prem is, is also able to be done in the cloud? And so really wanna talk about, you know, first, like how do you get at the network data in cloud environments, right? We'll use a couple examples. We're gonna look at Amazon Web Services and how they potentially do it. Um, we're gonna look at uh, Kubernetes, which is simply an orchestration environment for um, containers. And then kind of talk about what gap exists because of the way the traffic is acquired, especially when we're talking about private IP addressing and across hundreds or thousands of cloud accounts potentially, all rolled up into one aggregated location. And then uh, the proposal here is, and what we're gonna demonstrate is a way to potentially close that gap of using metadata that's found in cloud environments to enrich those logs, and then in turn, have some kind of attribution when we look at the, the aggregated data to know exactly where the traffic came from. Then I'm gonna walk through some very practical examples and we'll show how we uh, enhance some con logs and you know, what the possibilities might be there. And kind of wrap up with other possibilities. Where else could we get this metadata from to enrich these network logs? As, you know, as we talked about in the very beginning where Wendy spoke, evidence. The more evidence we can have, the better. So, you know, not to bore everybody, but really when we're talking about, you know, the cloud, we're really talking about, you know, two different planes, right? We've got the control plane where you interact with some kind of API, and it, it, it then in turn uses, right, some kind of controller to create these cloud resources, right? It's magic. I say, give me a compute instance, and boom, I get a compute instance. Give me a network with this, you know, structure, I get a network, right? The resultant of that, though, is a large amount of metadata that's associated with those cloud environments, right? So now I know exactly, you know, when it was provisioned, maybe who provisioned it, you know, where is it located, all of that data, right? So it's kind of taking the place of like a CMDB, if you would. And so clouds really, right, do cloud things, right? <laughs> I mean, outside of, you know, the cost savings, you know, people are moving their workloads to the cloud because of capabilities, right? You get this elastic nature. You could take compute environments and they can grow and shrink based upon load, right? Or they can follow the sun, or they can, you know, do any number of things. And that's great. Being elastic is great. But what happens there is the networks then that they are operating on are also elastic, right? The ephemeral nature of the address is, is really starting to creep in, right? We've had private IP addressing for a while, right? But really think about it from in a very elastic environment, right? Think about a, a cloud or a compute resource that grows in one hour and then completely shrinks and goes away. Well, what address was, you know, did that compute environment have during that one hour period? Right now, we may not be able to, to figure that out. And then on top of that, right, you, you talk about cloud environments being segmented further, right? And so inside of each cloud environment and most of the, you know, the three top three, AWS, Azure, and GCP, you also have virtual private clouds inside of there. And the private part is really the important part, right? So they have, like I spoke of, private IP addressing, but on top of that, they have a centralized touch point, right? In which where the data transitions from either one virtual private cloud to another, or to you know, an egress node to the internet, to a, a, a NAT, right, where it may be translated to use in some other place, right? Those are all components of you know, kind of those cloud environments. Now extrapolate that, right? So I have one cloud environment, one cloud account, right? So simple. It has five virtual private clouds, right? And then each one of those has a set of private IP addressing with it. Okay, I can probably figure something out, right? 
Now, expand that to an enterprise level. I have 500 accounts, each with five to 10 virtual private clouds, all with private IP addressing inside of them. Now I take all that data and I roll it up, right, to one central aggregated point. I've applied Zeek to them and I have all of these logs. Well, how do I know one private IP address in the logs from another? Where did it come from? Who generated it? You know, what was the compute instance behind that? That's really the auspice of why we thought this was kind of important to try to add some contextual data to the network logs as they're generated. The other thing is like the, the control plane side of things that the cloud providers have is very opaque, right? It, it, it's, it's really opaque, right? You really cannot see the network traffic that exists on the other side, right? All, it's a service, right? And that's the great part of it is I ask the service to do something and it does what I ask it to do. The networking components behind that, that network traffic cannot be seen by the user or by the consumer. So, but what we do have is that metadata. So let's shift gears just a little bit and I wanna talk about the acquisition of traffic in the cloud itself. And really wanna talk about altitude of acquisition and where do we actually give the network traffic over to Zeek to have it generate the logs, right? Because we're talking about attribution, the only way that attribution really can work is if it can be um, you know, tied to that, the, the generated data at the closest point of acquisition, right? And so that, it, it can complicate things when you talk about scale, right? And so here's this most simplest practical example there could be, right? In Amazon, you, you have a thing called VPC traffic mirroring. And basically what that does is you take an elastic network interface that's tied to a compute environment, and you can tell the, the traffic mirroring, say, hey, use that as a source, apply this filter to it to say, hey, I wanna just look at ICMP or I just wanna look at TCP, and then it encapsulates in VXLAN and ships it to another elastic network interface. Couldn't be more simple, right? That it then turned, that EC2 instance could be running Zeek or whatever it happens to be to actually you know, use that traffic. It, it's simply though just a mirror. So that, you know, you think about this from a very simplistic perspective, think about how you would scale that, right? When every time I have an elastic instance come up, it's elastic, that's the word, right? So this thing is, it can come and go really fast. How do I ensure all this traffic mirroring is starting to take place, right? That's a major complexity that we're gonna to have to solve as we kind of move forward to the cloud, but that's also another talk. So here's another example of you know, getting at the network traffic. This is a, a Kubernetes example. And so there's you know, three different ways you know, we kind of highlight where we could get the traffic from. And you know, so the large um, outside yellow, just think of it as just, the, it's just another Linux host, right? And so in some deployments of Kubernetes, depending on the, the CNI plugin used, there's a bridge interface that actually will allow you to get at the east, west, and north, south traffic of all pods inside of that environment, right? So a pod is nothing more than one to end containers that are all you know, kind of a, accumulated together to you know, provide some level of service, right? Well, if you sniff that bridge interface, then I'm gonna get all of the traffic, right? That's the utopic way of doing it, right? So I'd have a sensor per host, right? I'd just be running Zeek on each host. I'd get at the data at that, that primary location, and then I'd, I'd ship it off somewhere, right? Perfect. The problem is, it's kind of a utopia, right? In most cases, this bridge interface doesn't exist because the networking is done through a different plugin than, you know, maybe say it'd be Flannel or something like that, or Calico. What is more consistent, though, is that, that the, the environment has kind of standardized on using container D as the underlying container management system. So Docker and um, you know, Kubernetes rely on container D, right? So when Kubernetes says, hey, go make me um, a, a pod, it goes, okay, I'm gonna make you a pod, and I'm gonna make this virtual interface on the device, this the ETH, right? And this virtual interface simply has a pair, right, in another network namespace, Linux network namespace, that actually contains the other side of the network pair, and all it simply does is share the traffic. If, it, you know, if it's destined for you know, somewhere else on the host itself or even outside the host, it flows through that virtual interface. Well, that's great, let me just sniff that virtual interface. The problem is they're very elastic, they're ephemeral. Pod comes up, interface comes up. Pod goes down, interface goes away. 
right? So we have this issue of getting at the traffic at the right place. Thirdly, you could do it at a very um, small level, right? You could use a, side, a sidecar, right? Sidecar is really nothing more than an additional container that exists inside of the pod, in which when, when you add that sidecar, since it's a shared network inside of all the, uh, the pod itself and all the containers share one network, if I just VXLAN encapsulate the network traffic that the sidecar sees, it's all the traffic for that pod. And then I shift that traffic out to Zeek, and I can get that visibility. So three different ways, three different altitudes, right? But thing to kind of keep in mind here, when we're talking about attribution, it really kind of hinges on, hey, I'm going to do the conversion of that network data using Zeek, probably on the host itself in this example. And so what's the gap, right? So the attributable data that exists is in the control plane, right? Kind of already established that. And so really, it really comes down to time. If you go to your IT staff and go, hey, what's this IP address that I'm seeing right, in this log, they're gonna have to go and potentially go through all these control plane events, query you know, CloudTrail logs or you know, Kubernetes event logs or whatever it happens to be to find out at a given point in time, this IP address was given to this thing, whatever this thing is, right? And as you heard in the Microsoft talk earlier, that attribution is getting more and more difficult. And so I think this is really where this has power is if you can attribute the traffic and give it the metadata at the time that the Zeek log is created, then we don't necessarily have to go back and look at the data plane logs. We have the data we need already in the logs, and that's the idea. On top of that, some control plane data and events are, are, are expire, right? Within 24 hours, I think, maybe 48, in Kubernetes, the event no longer exists. It just goes away. And so if you're not logging that and putting that in some other log repository, when your you know, staff goes back to look for, hey, you know, 24 hours ago, we saw this IP address and it was you know, generating this traffic. And they go, well, that IP doesn't exist anymore and I have no idea what it was. So that's a real issue, right? And time, right? The quicker you can attribute the traffic to a compute environment, the, the, the quicker we can potentially solve the problem. And it might be the difference between exfiltration of data or not, right? So how do we close that gap, right? We've kind of how do we bridge those two planes together? So the idea is just some piece of middleware, right? That uses the IP address as its key, right? So the IP address exists in both planes, right? And that's where the altitude really comes into play. Because if you're grabbing the data at the altitude using the IP address that the control plane knows about, I can easily marry that data pair back together, right? And then add that enrichment to Zeek and then have it shipped out. And so that's what we've tried to do. So here's an example of uh, some metadata that's available to, uh, from AWS, right? And so this is an EC2 instance to just say, hey, you describe instance, and you get all this metadata. It's all this big, giant JSON blob. But the thing we really care about is this, what I'm gonna term the network key, right? It's this private IP address, this DPC IP address. Here's another example, right, in Kubernetes. Same exact thing. But look at this, the detail we can get from that metadata. And we'll quickly see how we might be able to enrich that data inside of the Zeek logs. So here's a, a con log, right, in which we've used that same network key and then we've taken the metadata from whatever, you know, AWS in this case, and added it to the con log. So now I can see things like, I know exactly which organizational account out of the 500 my company may have, this traffic came from. <laughs> Drill down one more. Which VPC inside of that account it came from. Which subnet it was operating on, right? Which exact instance ID inside of the environment this traffic can be attributed to, right? Now let's take it a step further. Since I know all this metadata about the instance, I also know things like security groups. I know what security groups are tied to that instance. So pretty quickly and stuff that Zeke is really good at, right? I can take that security group and go, hey, this traffic, which of these eight security groups that are tied to this instance would have allowed this traffic to flow through? So now if you're seeing traffic coming, you know, into a, a box on, on your network or inside of the cloud, and it's not supposed to be coming in there, how quickly can you go, oh, it's this exact rule. Let me go shut that down. 
right? You're not trying to figure it out, right? You know the exact rule that allowed the traffic to flow through, and you can quickly, you know, make whatever remediation. But also think about it from just a, uh, you know, an analysis perspective, right? If I have all of, you know, this data, I can say, hey, which of my instances are most voluminous, right? Which of my security groups are used the most? Which ones are never used, right? That way I may have security groups that are dead or not, you know, configuration control may have failed and I have something that, that's stale and I need to get rid of it. But then also think about, you know, how quickly you can pivot, right? We all you know the UID is easy, right, and pivoting. But in this case, like, hey, I have a log4j notice. I quickly can go, oh, this web server was talking to this LDAP server, hence by its name, and I know exactly which two compute environment instances in the cloud environment was generating the, the alert, right? And I can quickly pinpoint what I need to remediate. Think about it on the flip side. If I didn't have all of this, how long would it have taken, right, to discover this? And was the data even still available once I finally, you know, the, the analyst actually got around to trying to do the investigation? Same thing in Kubernetes, right? Have that network key. Here I can see two pods talking to each other. Database servers talking to a Redis server. They're on two separate nodes inside of the cluster. Here's its IP address, right? And I know the exact details associated with it. So I think this is, you know, potential for a lot of power as we move into these, these cloud environments. So how's this done, right? So this is really the meat of it. So we, what we do is query the API service of whatever, you know, the, the service source is and ensure that we have the IP address, the pre IP address we believe is gonna show up in the network logs and the network traces, and then we get all the metadata we want associated with it. And we transform that metadata into uh, just a TSV file for ingestion into Zeek. It looks a little bit like this, right? So you have, you know, this wouldn't all fit on one slide, so I wrapped it on the two, hence the pretty little arrow. So just think, like, this is one line, it's just a TSV, and here's the metadata that's associated with this, you know, each one of these instances, right? This is the exact same metadata we just saw in the enrichment. So then we take those TSV files, ingest them in Zeek via the input framework, right? So just a lookup table, the key of the table is the IP address that we saw, the, the network key, and then the table of records is just all the metadata is the records itself. So then we just add to a variable like dollar sign con, right? and augment a set of records to that. Now the, 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 the rub really comes into, how do I keep this up to date, right? So there's gotta be a, a process. Now, like our initial prototype is just a polling, right? Like every two minutes, we poll Amazon, go, hey, in this availability zone, give me all the EC2 instances that are currently in a state of running, right? And then give me all this metadata. And then I update the TSV file, Zeke rereads the TSV file, updates the record set, right? And then turn, all the new lookups are now reflected with that new data. What really should happen is some type of watching service, right? Polling is not optimal, and we all know that. So what you really need is some mechanism inside of Amazon, like you know, some kind of event generation system, like, hey, a new EC2 instance came up, it's in a state of running, tell something else, which in turn would then update this data, right? And so I, I think it's, it's highly probable. Like in Kubernetes, this is easier, because they have a built-in watcher service by default. You can just watch for certain events with certain characteristics, and as soon as you see them, you get all this metadata, and you just update the TSV. It's super simple. So think of all, you know, what other things we could use, right? What about authentication servers? What if the authentication server was able to map the IP address that the user authenticated from, right? And then on the network itself, if we can attribute that, I can say, this user generated this data. We can link these two together, right? To a FA logs, with any cloud provider. Pretty much anything that has an IP address that's referenceable at the altitude in which we can capture the traffic. That's really the rub, right? Because if it, once it goes through some kind of translation or three or four steps higher, I can't attribute it back to the actual compute instance, right? So in cloud environments, we're really talking about putting Zeek at the highest level possible, but yet you can still do the attribution. It's kind of a trade-off and it's kind of a trick to do. And it's gonna require a lot of automation associated with 
the cloud environment itself and using the tools that are available inside of that. But also think about what if you could use your orchestration tools and go, I can annotate now the network traffic based upon the version of the application that was responsible for it. So I push out a new version of my pipeline and now I have a new version running and I'm seeing anomalous traffic. Well, I know it's that this version I didn't see it, then this version I do, I quickly go, hey, there's a problem, right? It's not just for security. I think it can be used by a lot of different elements of the organization. I probably flew through that fairly quickly. Any questions? Questions for Stan, folks? I have at least one. At least one. <laughs> Right. Uh, I didn't check online. I'll, I'll, I'll look in a second. I was curious then. Um, so with these log enrichments, there is every now and then a race condition where yes. you don't really know whether you will get the needed information by the time the, the, the log entry gets written out. Right. I was just wondering if you're hitting that a bunch or in the setting, maybe not at all. Yeah, it definitely is there. And that's really where that watching condition happens, right? So if you, if you use a watcher service, right, and, and, and the service immediately says, hey, this thing is being created, right? and it's going to have this characteristic, this IP address and all of these characteristics, before it becomes in the state of running, right? we could be enriching Zeke at that point. We could be telling Zeke about it. The flip side is then if it never does come up, you've got this stale thing that kind of comes up because that's the problem in some container environments. You know, maybe something's coming up and then it has some kind of error state and then it completely collapses back down. So there's a real problem there with definitely that. There could be seconds, right, that exist of network traffic being generated that you're not getting logged or not getting attributed or it's being misattributed because this thing before had an IP address and it no longer exists and it's still in the, the record set. So. Right, right. Thank you. Perfect. Oh, there's one back there. Great. Thank you, guys. Cheers, thanks very much. Um, have you tried integrating it with the, the Zeek host agent um, to, to try and achieve this, this sort of enrichment? No, and that was actually an idea I received you know, earlier yesterday you know, when someone was talking about the host agents. I think that would be a really well way to get that data in. This is really just, hey, what's the quickest way I can potentially prove that this would work, right? And then, you know, hey, can I give it some customers and actually we're running it internally to Corelight to see what's its value? Does this actually have value to the to consumers of the data and, and how can we apply it to security. But yeah, I think that's definitely a, a viable option. All right, any other questions? We'll take a quick look online, nothing there or did you go? Okay, cool. Well, if there's nothing else, let's, uh, thanks Dan for a great talk. Yeah, thank, thank you for coming. Thank